Hi, welcome to What's on Your Shelf. And today we are in Berlin, Germany. And my guest today is an award-winning entrepreneur, an expert on social innovation, the founder of The Do, located in Berlin, Germany, Hong Kong, New York. Florian Hoffman believes that we need to give people and businesses the tools to jointly create economic success through new solutions to the problems of our times. And that, this is the basis of our future. Ladies and gentlemen, on what's on your shelf today. Thank you so much for allowing to sit with us and have a conversation on what's on your shelf. Thanks and for I, having me. I'm sorry, this I know is an ambush for this is not your entire shelf. Guys, I was in Berlin and I had to grab Florian for this conversation. So most of his books are at home. So we'll try and figure out how to still talk about some of the books that have been impactful to him. He is an author and that is where we're gonna start the conversation. But before that, Florian, for somebody who is meeting you today for the very first time, who is Florian and what do you do? Oh, that's a profound question. Uh, Mike, it's wonderful to be sitting here with you. So I'm a, uh, I'm a father, I'm a husband, um, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an investor, and I believe that we all collectively face big challenges in our world, for our environment, for our societies, for uh, the future of our children, and that with entrepreneurial effort, we can actually make a positive contribution. And um, 10 years ago, I started an organization called The Do, which um, aims to empower people uh, and help change the world of business so that entrepreneurship can be part of the solution, not the problem, not the polluter, but the inventor of new ways of solving some of the big issues that we're facing. So over the last 10 years, we've uh, built lots of fellowship programs mm -hmm. where we have the big privilege that you're one of the uh, alumnus of one of the programs. Yeah. Um, uh, with over 60,000 amazing entrepreneurs from over 100 countries graduating, we um, have a private university where we teach sustainability, innovation, leadership to uh, leaders in government and in business. And we have an advisory where we help businesses make a transition towards a green economy faster. Mm -hmm. Our new world. Tell us about our new world and what are the thoughts and processes that pushed you to write this book? Yeah, so our new world um, uh, came about during the pandemic and I was approached by a publisher. I had always wanted to write. I was in academia for a little bit, um, but as, an, as a busy entrepreneur, I have always found it hard to find the time. And during the pandemic, I became more and more concerned about one particular problem that led me to write this book. And that problem um, is that I feel that more and more people um, feel that no matter what they do, it isn't really going to make a difference. You know, whether I and my family become vegetarians or do something for the environment, it's not going to solve the climate crisis. If I donate a little bit of money, that's not going to change uh, the anger and sort of the uh, uh, sort of discrepancy between rich and poor. So I feel very powerless and more and more people I sensed felt powerless and as a result gave up and also became angry. And I'm really concerned about that trend. And at the same time, due to the work that I did through people like you and many, many others that I've uh, seen and being able to support, I know that there's so many amazing people out there that are just uh, making a difference in whatever way they can. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to write that book as a journey uh, through the world to about 100 selected people and places where uh, I describe very different types of people, uh, rich people, poor people, very educated, less educated, but um, all, all of them united by the idea that they didn't give up, but they just got up and started doing something that they felt could make a contribution. And so the book ideally is um, about the secret that even though we believe we're powerless, mm -hmm. actually we're not, right? Everyone has a, of us has a lot of power to influence the people around us. And it doesn't matter whether that's 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, a couple of billion people. It's about all of us getting up and sort of making our contribution because I believe that will make us happier personally 
And this is what will create progress and yeah. solves the problems that we face. Wow. So 60,000 is, is such a huge number to think about. And what, what are some of the most outstanding projects? Because I can't imagine that year in, year out, you meet new people, you meet new ideas, you meet people who are so energized to do what they believe they want to do to make mm -hmm. that difference. But there will still be somebody next year. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how, how do you look at it? Because you meet these amazing people year in, year out. Mm -hmm. Is it not overwhelming? Um, no, I think to me it's extremely um, rewarding. Because on the one hand, it makes me very humble because, you know, I don't look at uh, each individual uh, entrepreneur and change maker in the sense of are they better than the next person, but more what's their story and what hurdles did they overcome, what resilience did they have to build in order to uh, uh, get to where they are now, right? And um, listening to these stories and listening about what drives a person, right, the, because ultimately, being an entrepreneur and the, the stories in the book is about asking yourself the really hard question of what really drives you, what really moves you, what really motivates you. And um, uh, being so honest to ask yourself these tough questions and keep searching for the answers. This is, I think, something that I find very inspiring. And meeting these incredible people around the world um, just uh, gives me the chance to keep learning from them about how they're trying to answer the question. About 60,000 entrepreneurs have spoken to you, Florian, and they desire to maybe share a moment and just a tete a tete with you. But what is that one outstanding characteristic you can say you've seen in these people from all walks of life? Mm -hmm. Um, there's a couple, but I, if you had to pin me down to one, I would say um, courage. So I think it's the courage to um, get up when you could stay on the couch, to um, uh, believe in yourself when sometimes it would be more comfortable to go with the flow, um, and the courage to try something that at least you don't know yet fully how it will pan out or how it actually will work. Um, and um, that I would say combined with the curiosity, the interest in trying something new is what I think is the defining factor, right? And courage, they, these were very different situations and you can't compare them. We've had entrepreneurs uh, that were doing, um, as you know, you know, women's rights issue in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or in, in countries where it's actually personally dangerous to them. Uh, but we also had uh, somebody here who gave up their parents' dream of what they wanted to do in France and instead uh, uh, started something in sports for children or so, right? So um, all sorts of different types of courage, but this idea of, okay, I'm going to not go a comfortable route. I'm going to believe in myself, dare to believe in myself and my ideas, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to give it a go. Mm -hmm. Over the number of fellowships you've done, over the last 10 years, to you personally? Are there some one or two that you has, has been so outstanding to you that went beyond what you thought it would be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of programs or terms groups? Of programs or, and also yeah. impact on yourself. Because sometimes you meet people who yeah. you thought you're going to inspire. Yeah. But they end up inspiring you instead. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, as I said, that's why my biggest privilege is to see so many such diverse people from whom I always learn something. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you, if you ask about the biggest impact on me, so the belief of the do school is learning by doing. So that means you don't just come together and you learn a theory, but you actually work on a real life problem. And through that, you grow as a leader, you grow as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the most impactful programs that I remember are the earliest ones because they, were, they are the ones where I was still most hands-on. So I remember one of our first programs in New York City with uh, Bloomberg when he was mayor on um, where the challenge was to invent, uh, invent the first um, uh, reusable coffee cup system. So, you know, what's now 
quite standard, but to have uh, mugs that you buy and you give them back and they get uh, cleaned and uh, used again. Um, and I, I remember uh, fellows who were, you know, coming up uh, with ideas, even though they came from all sorts of different continents and countries mm -hmm. that a Starbucks in the US hadn't been able to think about before. And why? Because they looked at the problem with a fresh perspective with a group of diverse opinions. And they were again sort of courageous enough to go for not just the obvious answer, but for the one that would really make a difference. So that was one that I really was impressed by. Another one is we worked with the United Nations and these were actually corporate leaders, so innovation leaders from all sorts of different companies. So medical companies, energy companies, um, uh, material companies, uh, um, and they basically challenged, or they had the, the challenge was to say, if we want to support the UN goals, so the sustainable development goals, how would our business have to change, mm -hmm. right? And they had a year to actually develop a new business model and implement that and see how they collaborated across the different companies, how they grew as leaders, how they also challenged their own corporate beliefs. That was another program that uh, I learned a lot uh, from just uh, journeying with the participants and, and observing how they were changing as leaders and how they were also developing as leaders. Mm -hmm. To somebody who's going to buy this book, yeah. what are they going to meet in this book? Oh, they're going to meet um, uh, 60, 70, 80 incredible people. The book is written as a whole series of very short chapters where we're trying to describe what the new world looks like. So this world in which actually a lot of people are already courageous and taking action. So they'll meet somebody like Shubangi, who uh, learned in India uh, always about the problem of street children, people that are uh, kids that are working on the street. And the government always complained that they never made it into school. Right? And she, as in her mid-20s, turned the idea around and said, well, if kids aren't coming to school, why isn't school coming to them? And I, uh, I uh, describe how I was standing in Mumbai in the middle of a crazy busy street in a circle. And at 8.30, suddenly 50 kids between 8 and 12 showed up for their math lesson in the middle of this roundabout. And we did 45 minutes of math and 10 minutes of play, and then they were gone again to their work, right? And the power that such a simple idea has that if your kids, you can't get the kids into the school building, why don't you bring the school building to them, right? Yeah. But also somebody, you'll meet somebody like Niall, who um, is uh, a famous corporate leader and in his early 40s, you know, um, made it on the board of a global company, um, makes millions of dollars, uh, is at the top of his game. And then from one day um, takes a good look in the mirror and decides to hand in his resignation and actually then thinks about how he can make a difference in the world and decides to uh, support a startup for um, with scientists together who have invented a one of the first formula to build a type of plastic that dissolves without leaving any traces behind. And now a couple of years later is actually a unicorn entrepreneur because he's developed a, a mug that you use for three months and then you throw it into the bush and it dissolves and is gone. Yeah. Oh. So those are the types of people that you'll meet, um, but not everybody is a superhero. These are everyday people like all of us. And we're trying to describe what decisions they took and what they learned from it and how they're defining their journey. Mm -hmm. And out of that, ideally to get a bit of a puzzle piece yeah. of how the new world could look like and to ultimately ask the question for everyone who's reading the book, what is your contribution? What do you want to do? To that person who thinks, no, I can't invent such a cup that dissolves, what's his responsibility when you're talking about the new world? I think her or his responsibility is to ask him or herself the, uh, or themselves the hard question of, or the fun question of, what am I here for? What drives me? What gives me joy? What gives me passion? And what's my purpose? And then um, how can I have a, a comp uh, an impact, a contribution onto uh, the group bigger than myself? And everybody has to define what that means. Is that in their school? Is that in their community? Is that in their country, in the, in the entire world? So it's not about am I better or more impactful than the other, but it's like, what's my role? What, do, what role do I want to play? Mm -hmm. And um, to dare 
think that way, right? And I know this is sometimes really hard when you're struggling to make ends meet, when you have to feed your kids, when you're really tired from hard work, mm -hmm. right? But um, uh, the book also talks about people that really have no means, that have no resources, and that nevertheless sort of got passionate about a topic, got passionate about something that they believed in, mm -hmm. and went for it. And that's something everybody can do. Yeah, I feel like it's, uh, it's also something to really celebrate and appreciate what you, together with the team at the Blue School, has done. And I'm just looking forward to what the future looks like. I, I can't wait to see some of the solutions that the, that next world, that new world we, we talk about, how we'll be tackling those challenges, especially now with the big conversation on climate change that is here. And, and by the way, I, 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 I want to get your take on that and ask what, from where you sit, what, what, are, what, what, is, what is, how would we affect that whole conversation on climate change? Oh, that's a, obviously a, a, a huge question, but <clears throat> if you allow me, I'll, I'll start first with um, um, what you said about the building of community, right? I really believe that one of the key efforts that we need to undertake is to build um, communities of people who are able to support each other. You know, we talk a lot about what makes a doer, what makes a great doer. And mm -hmm. one piece is that they need to have a sense of passion and purpose, that they need to be a bit courageous, but also doing it all alone is impossible. You need to be supported by like-minded people that give you a bit of energy and strength in times when it's really hard. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this is now true um, for all of society, you know, because we live in a world where um, uh, media today makes their money with anger and fear. Yes. Right. So this is what gives you the click rates that you need to sell advertisement. And so suddenly you live in an environment where um, you're hit constantly by negative news. Mm -hmm. And if you're constantly hit by negative news, your view of the world might be one that is sort of uh, quite, quite depressing. And I think more and more people are struggling from that. And to counter that, I think we again need to build these networks of people that actually understand that there is opportunity, that there is hope, and that there is a future for all of us. But we need to actually do something about it in order to bring it about. And that for me is also relating to the big question of climate change, right? You know, we all know that we live in a, uh, in a climate catastrophe by now, that there are certain tipping points that have been overstepped. And we see it if you look just at uh, sort of the reporting on the last month between flooding and fires and droughts and uh, that uh, weather extremes are getting worse. And that's a reality we will have to live with. Um, now, you, I think there's now two big conversations going on. The one is, do we need to stop what we're doing and do we need to change our economies and do we need to consume less, right? So in Europe, there's a big debate about degrowth, so getting away from the idea of having to grow the economy. And all that is interesting, but obviously, if you're thinking about especially countries that are less well off, are you going to tell somebody that grows up in a slum that they can't hope and aspire to own a house or have a car or go shopping or so? I think that's, that's very hard and that's why I, I still think that a part of the answer, a big part needs to be innovation, right? So what new solutions can we develop that help us um, uh, really solve some of the tricky problems like we just talked about with the plastic pollution, right? So by, there's great numbers that until 2050s, uh, I think about roughly 80% of, uh, of oil is actually used for plastic production, right? So that means uh, there's gonna be such an explosion again of plastics, how do we solve for that? Um, and so I look sometimes at our world and I think, you know, we've just, we're, we're trying to find solutions as we go along. Uh, 70, 80 years ago, plastic was a great solution to suddenly make things more sterile and more durable and everybody was excited about plastic. Mm. Today we know that it actually has some very, very bad uh, sort of consequences and so now we need to iterate and find the next solution. 
Um, and so keeping developing, keeping learning, keeping solving problems that, um, that create inefficiencies or that create negative consequences is, I think, for me, the, the best way and the, 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 the biggest promise for me uh, to move us forward also on, on the climate catastrophe. And I believe in people and I believe in people's ideas and that's what I, why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. So Florian, to conclude the conversation on our new world. Yeah. The title is written both in English and in German. Yes. How do you read this German version? Die neue Welt. Die neue Welt. That's it. So did you have to write the book twice or you wrote it once and then translate it? So I, um, I actually wrote it in German because uh, it's a German publisher and it came out in German first and then it did reasonably well and then the, uh, the idea came to translate it and then um, we had, the publisher actually had somebody who did a rough translation and then I rewrote the English translation again. Mm -hmm. So I did have to rewrite uh, write it twice, but that was actually fun. When you uh, build a book, um, you go through the, uh, the chapters so many times, it goes mm -hmm. through so many transformations that you're so intimately familiar with it at the end mm -hmm. that then putting it into a different language is, um, is, is just one more step, but it's not redoing the whole baby. Okay. So, so Florian, tell us about Aristotle's ethics. This is also another book you... Ah, uh, yeah. So um, I put Aristotle uh, on, on the list um, because um, he, he was for me a, a very influential thinker in my 20s when I studied philosophy and politics and really thought about how do I form my, my worldview. And, uh, you know, when, when we grow up and become adults, I think there's this uh, big question of how do we make sense of the world and under by what values do we want to live? And um, uh, many worldviews have sort of a very set hierarchy of values, right? So some might be religious, you believe in a certain being, some might be uh, the most important value is freedom or is equality or is liberty, right? And so um, uh, very often people grow into value beliefs that define quite a bit of their lives yeah. based on sort of a, a hierarchical structure of what their values are. And what I loved about um, uh, Aristotle and why he influenced my thinking quite a bit is that he's one of the foundational philosophers, you know, uh, Greece a couple of thousand years ago. But he was the first one who introduced this idea of value pluralism that um, there's different values that are important in life mm -hmm. and um, it's sometimes really really hard to pick which one is more important mm -hmm. right is freedom more important than equality um, is liberty more important than happiness mm -hmm. is um, uh, health more important my health more important than your health and how do we navigate that? And for me, um, growing into uh, sort of where do I have an impact in the world and how do I think about the world? You know, there were these two big schools of you have a very strong sense of duty mm. and certain values that are the way they are. Or there was a, sort of a more modern school, they called it then postmodernism of, you know, nothing is real and do we live in a simulation and with AI, is it going to take all, uh, over all of what it means to be human? Yeah. Um, and Aristotle and the ethics, they taught me that um, it doesn't have to be the extremes, but you can have a, a set of values that you believe in. You can also believe in um, humans. You can believe in progress, but you have to be aware that there's conflicts also between goals and amongst goals and amongst values. And if you're aware of those values and the conflict between them, then that helps you to actually take better decisions. But it also makes you, I think, and that's for me is the most important one, makes you a more um, empathetic human being, right? Because you might have your set of values. And when you meet somebody who has a different set of values, mm -hmm then you're um, able to say, well, um, I still, I thought about this a lot and this is what drives me, but I understand why somebody else has a different point of view. I understand that it isn't 
one perfect situation, but that there are clashes and inconsistencies. And I therefore am more tolerant, right? And this idea of being empathetical towards other people who have different points of views, different, different ideas of what the good life looks like, I think is really important in a world that becomes less and less tolerant, where we're always reading more and more about the stuff that anyways we believe in, because that's what the algorithm gives us, yeah. right? Um, and so that's why Aristotle, for me, was a very influential thinker. Today you, you lead an organization that is so vibrant and has, I would say, done, has worked in various parts of the world. I love the culture in this place. I love how easy, uh, when you walk into the organization, you can see people who are working with this, but at the same time, the delivery on the things the organization does are seriously high impact. But I'm looking at that from a point of leadership. Do you find yourself in a place where this pluralism you're speaking about, conflicts, maybe your value system, what you want to achieve in a certain project in a setup such as this? I do think that the pluralism is, um, for me, always a guiding reflection when I think about what are the, the values that really define me and the ones that I want my life uh, sort of to, uh, to strive for. And being able to um, discuss that and reflect on that with other people, especially those who have a different idea of what the good life looks like, for that, I think pluralism is really important. And I do think that you can actually um, be, you can build really powerful, strong relationships and also um, sort of communities of performing excellence with people that have very different opinions and convictions from you. Mm. If you're able to say, Mike, you believe in this, I'm Florian, I believe in this, but on this part, we overlap. Mm -hmm. And here's something that we both think is important. Let's work on that and let's really try to be very effective in driving that forward. Right? And I think, again, um, <clears throat> in, in the last years, we've been facing a situation that we, to a certain extent, for example, in Europe, thought wasn't possible anymore. Right? War in Europe, uh, deglobalization after the pandemic, supply chains being disrupt, uh, disrupted so that People say, well, we have to sort things out on our continent, right? We don't want to be dependent on Africa, or we don't want to be dependent on Asia, or the US doesn't want to be dependent on China, right? And so there's a lot of thinking about uh, separating yourself again. Mm. And so I think in a way, these um, thousand year old books from these uh, Greek dudes like yeah. Aristotle in that sense are super topical today um, because it is about how do we navigate difference? Yeah. And how do we find a system for navigating difference when we say maybe out of 10 things we can't really agree on, but how do we, on these two that we can, how do we drive those forward? And how do we drive those forward even in celebrating our difference, right? The world doesn't need to agree on everything, but there's things that concern us all. Mm. Like, for example, you talked about uh, the uh, climate change, right? Yeah. And no matter what we believe in, we need to make a, we need to be faster there. We're not delivering against the 2030 goals. Mm. We need to speed up. And for that, it takes all of us. Okay. So, Florian, talk to us about consistency, irony, and solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of those. So that's the, um, the second book out of my um, philosophy uh, years. Okay. Yours, um, you, yours, you, are you so much into philosophy or you used to be? Um, I, the, the honest answer is that I used to be. So by now, A, I, I don't have the time and the energy to go through these very complicated books anymore. But for a couple of years, I was very into philosophy, political philosophy. I studied it at Oxford. Um, uh, started a doctorate there and was very, very serious about it. And um, that is a book that was written by a very influential thinker called Richard Rorty um, from the US. And he, um, uh, he, he sort of took that, uh, in a way, that uh, whole part of how do we think about the good life and how do we think about society a little bit further 
um, because uh, today you have, uh, and this is now, I'm telling it very quickly, but you have people who believe in personal rights and individual rights. Mm -hmm. And um, you have uh, uh, people who believe in particular rights, identity groups, right? Mm -hmm. So um, because of whatever happened to us, we have certain rights or not. And that sometimes clashes with the people who say, no, everybody is the same. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the same rights and duties and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, Richard Rorty, again, um, was one of these uh, thinkers that I appreciate because he's trying to go into the gray areas, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and the way he went into the gray areas is to say, well, actually to say we live in a culture-free world where everybody just has by law exactly the same rights is not realistic because culture and identity permeates everything we do. And we have to be a little bit ironic about it. And we have to look at ourselves uh, in a way that makes us sometimes maybe laugh and not take ourselves so seriously. And when we get to that point, then we can actually try to create fair systems, even though we understand that the perfectly correct way of saying everybody's the same might not even be possible, right? Mm -hmm. But that, um, that if we are able to look at ourselves with irony and our own s situation with irony um, and don't take ourselves so super important, that again will make us more empathetic towards the other, mm -hmm. towards people that have other opinions and other worldviews and want to do things differently in society. And if we're all like that, then we are able to um, greet each other with sympathy because we know that we're not perfect and then we'll find ways of coexistence that will give all of us the opportunity to have a good life. Mm. With that as a, a, a hindsight, Florian, these two words, fairness, equality, what do they bring to you? So, um, so obviously, I do believe in equality of opportunity. You know, one of the big uh, reasons why we started um, uh, the, the fellowship programs for young entrepreneurs from around <coughs> the world, and you know that they're extremely competitive, thousands of entrepreneurs apply to get a, a couple of spots, mm -hmm. but was exactly because we felt that, um, you know, you can go to these um, really prestigious universities to study, but usually the people who make it to these universities are privileged people, no matter where, which country or what skin color or what religious background, mm. but they're usually privileged people in their society. And we believe that a good ideas and strong entrepreneurial ideas come from all walks of life. And the more we increase diversity, the more each one of us will benefit from that because the entrepreneurial skills that somebody has who grows up um, in, in a township to somebody who goes to Harvard Business School are very different, mm. but they're both super relevant. Yeah. So if you bring those two people together, they will learn a ton of stuff from each other. And so that's where um, uh, obviously the, I also am concerned about equality in society because I just think it's a better society when the difference between rich and poor aren't so high, right? I think the more equality there is, the better, the better sense of community there is. Mm -hmm. But what I'm more concerned with is really the quality of opportunity. I think people are so diverse, there will always be different outcomes. Some people are very driven. Some people don't care about work. Some people want to make a huge difference. Some people just want to have fun and that's all good, mm -hmm. right? There's uh, sort of all of us are different. But I think the op sort of the idea that everybody should have ideally the same opportunity, um, that is something that I, I strongly believe in and that I'm also trying to work on, right? That's why I also think there's, in all of these things like technology, there's amazing opportunity, mm -hmm. right? We, you know, we have uh, um, uh, some fellows who have built these models of training youngsters in Africa or in Southeast Asia or in Latin America in very income poor environments tech skills and suddenly they can get global jobs with really good pay and so just one example of how yeah. technology levels the playing field. Yeah. So that's on the equality piece on, on um, I mean fairness I think is sort of is, is a general uh, value but not one that I've to be honest I've been thinking a lot about. Um, um, I think ideally you're fair but to me fairness is almost more something for my private life. Am I fair to my partner and wife? Am I fair to my 
um, to my children, in the way I raise them, in the way I look at them. Um, for, the, for the business world, not something that I think too much about. Mm. Okay. This book here, The Big Five for Life. The Big Five for Life, yes, um, uh, is a leadership book. And the reason why I picked it in my frantic list collection that we did today yeah. is because um, I think it's a really cool example of how you can use a, an emotional story and tools and combine them into a, giving people guidance on their own journey. So the book is basically about a, um, a, a guy whose mentor and very successful business leader is dying. Mm -hmm. And he tells the story of his mentor and how he actually became successful as an entrepreneur, not by being terribly interested in um, being the best entrepreneur, but in being actually really invested in the enterprise of making a good life for himself and others. Mm -hmm. And how that created the community, the energy in his businesses and the friendships that ultimately made him a rich man. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the, it's, a, it's a parable, a story that um, uh, gives people just a couple of really fun reflection tools to again think about their own journey. What is it that I want? What is it that I stand for? What is my purpose and how do I try to make a difference? And how can I sort of actually make what drive, what thrives or what makes me thrive, what makes me flourish or, you know, Ken Robinson calls it flow. Mm -hmm. uh, what the stuff that gives me flow that makes me happy. How can I make that the majority of my time? Right? And how can I turn that into a career, into a, a business, into a work in a company or in a government or in a social sector, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's what the Big <laughs> Five for Life is about. And it's been massively successful in Europe and the US sold a couple of million copies. Mm -hmm. And I think it again shows that all of us are looking for this, right? Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I don't want to do work that's, that's, uh, that's fun, right? Or I don't want to make a difference or uh, I couldn't care less about the world, right? Um, uh, obviously, there's a lot of people who are just struggling with realities. Yeah. And then there's people who I think still are, have been brought up in incentive systems where it's important what, how much money they make and what their title is. And I think we can, to a certain extent, I would argue we can free ourselves from those sort of outer pressures and really listen to ourselves what moves us, what it is that we want to do with this time on earth and how do we drive those ideas forward. I, I want to, to reflect that on, on your journey. When you started, you had a dream, you had a desire, you had a vision. Has that changed over the last 10 years? Um, the, the vision hasn't changed. Namely, the vision was always to say, um, business and entrepreneurship have to become part of the solution and not part of the problem. And my superpower is I can hopefully um, empower people to make their dreams, but also their impact come true, make them effective. Mm. Um, and that remains the vision to this day. What has changed is obviously, you know, we started out with a couple of people in a, a, a tiny little office in New York. By now we have a campus here in Berlin, we have the campus in Hong Kong, we have offices in New York and Hamburg. Um, uh, it's a couple of thousand people teaching every year, there's 100 employees, so driving the programs. So obviously the organization has grown in with that, the question of where can we make a difference, right? And so we started out focusing on amazing young entrepreneurs. Then we realized if we really want to change the world of business, we need to train leaders in companies as well and in government. Mm -hmm. And then we learned, oh yes, we need to focus on the individual, but we also need to focus on the organization because the way these organizations are built needs to change so they can be faster, more innovative, they can incorporate sustainability. And even though everybody wants to change a company, right? that's what leaders very often try to do, it's very hard. These companies are sometimes hundreds of years old yeah. and making them shift is an is sort of a, takes a lot of energy. And so our, our interventions and what we work on has grown. 
but the vision is still the same. I'm still getting out of the bed uh, in the morning um, uh, and I'm happy about the work that I'm allowed to, uh, to do, right? So I'm, by now I, I could probably also do other things and I, have, I invest a little bit or I write books or I uh, do other stuff, but I still work every day on the do and for the do because I believe now more than ever um, we need to make sure that we're moving on these problems faster because time is running away on climate, on the, on the societal issues, uh, you know, youth unemployment, something we've talked about uh, again and again. Yeah. The problem is not going away, it's growing in parts of the world, uh, certainly the part of the world you're from, right? Yes. With so many young talents, yes. no jobs for them, yeah. right? How do, we, how do we solve for that? There's so much amazing talent yeah. and so many young people that want to make it different for their, themselves, their families and their continent or their countries. And those, and those are the things that still motivate me. So when I look at where you started, and every entrepreneur's battle is resource. Yeah. You've worked with big organizations who have great influence, not only in their, their spaces, their industry, but also sometimes in government. And um, the biggest battle most entrepreneurs have is, I'm at a place where I need resources, especially financial, and the person who is offering that resource has a different agenda, has a different way of looking at what you're doing. Did you ever encounter such and, and how do you deal with it? Yes, so I think there's a couple of philosophical points, but maybe the more interesting ones are the very practical ones. I always believe that your, um, your best investor is your first client. Right? So don't focus on where you're trying to get money from to do something, but try to really find out what problem you're solving for. What is it? Where, you, where can you create value? And if you found a way to create value, people will appreciate that. And it's usually the people who have that problem. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who are going to be your first supporters. Right. And so in um, it, my journey or our journey was a total accident, right? We never planned to start the do school. We had uh, the privilege of, uh, because before that I had started a foundation and we had brought together 50 Nobel Prize winners and big entrepreneurs and whatever. And we asked them what is needed. And they said, well, it needs a place that helps people become really great doers. And we said, well, no problem. Uh, let's find a university and let's convince them to do it. And so I ran around university campuses and everybody was like, we don't, we are not interested in that. And so then some of these people came back to me and said, well, we talked about that we need support on empowering people to be great doers. Um, what do we do now? And then I said, well, then let's just do it ourselves. Then we started ourselves and they immediately said, well, yes, if you do it, I'll support you. Right. So that means I think the, um, my, my advice would always be don't try to come up with a concept that you believe might cater to investors or that you think s sells well or whatnot. Mm. Um, you know, the entrepreneurial journey is hard anyways. You're going to have your ups and downs. Yeah. And in order to be resilient, you'll need to be really convinced of what it is you do. And if, if you keep on learning, um, then you will succeed because, and that would be my second advice, um, I know hardly any entrepreneur who started with a business model or an idea mm -hmm. and five or ten years later they were still doing that, right? You keep learning and iterating as you go along mm -hmm. and you keep growing in your understanding of the problem. That's why we always say as a young entrepreneur or as a, even a leader in a company, it's more of the most important first skill is to fall in love with the problem, mm. right? Because everybody very quickly wants to offer a solution, but it's people who really understand the problem that are able to come up with good solutions, mm. right? So that's where, where, again, I think if you really have a deep understanding for the problem, then again, it's less likely that you have mission drift because somebody says, I give you $10,000 if you do that over here, mm. right? Um, and then, uh, the, the third one I would say is try to really start 
as quickly as possible and as small as possible, mm. right? The, the, there's so many stories out there where, the, where we're celebrating the person who's raised a hundred million dollars or yeah. who's, uh, who's succeeded in this or that, mm. right? But um, uh, one of our um, advisors uh, said this funny, uh, made this funny joke to say, you know, every overnight success lasts eight years on average. Mm. <laughs> in my experience, that's quite true. Um, so, you know, all these people where you read cool newspaper articles about how much money they make and how much investment they have and whatnot, um, that might be true or not, that might be relevant or not, um, but all of them usually have a long journey after them where they somehow started with something small and tried to learn on the way. Mm. Generally, you know, sometimes when, when people talk about easy come, easy go, it always sounds like just an encouragement. Somebody is just trying to, to allow you to get by. But to that entrepreneur today who is watching this podcast, Florian, who, who is also almost giving up, they look at the product, they look at the value they are offering, and they feel like, why isn't the world accepting this thing? Why aren't they seeing it? What would you tell him? Um, I would first of all tell, um, uh, tell them that um, don't worry, you'll be fine. Um, and uh, look at the things that work in life, your health and the people that love you and all that. The second is, I think it's a really good situation to be in because every crisis, I believe, is a huge opportunity. And sometimes this means to realize that your idea for a business or a social project or whatever just wasn't all that great, <laughs> right? And maybe it actually makes sense to close shop, learn from it, and come back much stronger. And maybe I've met so many people whose second or third or fourth or fifth idea was an incredible one. And they went through, you know, I had two startups which were a total catastrophe, to totally tanked. But they taught me so much about what I'm doing now that um, I'm really thankful for those experiences, right? It's Florian, is closing shop not equated to giving up? No, I think it's uh, uh, failing is totally okay. Uh, failure is not a problem at all, right? It's, it is this old stupid sentence that you need to get up the next morning and come up with your next idea. It's also not a problem to try out being an entrepreneur for a couple of years and to decide I'm much better suited to go into a big company or government or, uh, or in a social organization and I'm trying to drive change from within. That's a totally great decision. This is all part of your learning journey. Um, but I think it's important to reflect, am I giving up because I'm low on energy right now? Or because I really looked at it from all angles and I think this is not the best idea and I keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. If you're really, if the situation is that you still believe in what you do, you think there's a real opportunity, um, but it's just extremely hard right now, then I would support you in continuing to hang on and find ways of building resilience. Because every entrepreneur's journey is about um, those ups and downs. And I think then the question is, what is it that you need to learn that you haven't learned that will get you out of that slump, right? Because the other bit that makes being an entrepreneur a great experience is you have to keep learning every day. And you also know that there's much more you don't know than what you know, right? And where do you find that next piece, that next nugget of where is that person that you can learn something from that can help you to get out of this problem? Right. And ideally, that is those are the people that will support you, that will be a sort of uh, um, ideally open to helping you out and giving you the energy that you need to build and grow resilience. And then the last thing I'll say is um, if you're down, even though you believe in what you do, try to find like minded people. Right. To our question coming back to community, try to build a community and a support system around yourself that will help you to get also through the tough times and that you uh, can celebrate your successes with. Just to move forward. And I want you to talk to us about the book Principles. Uh, Principles. Principles is a super weird book and a super interesting book. It was written by Ray Dalio, who is sort of one of the world's uh, most famous investors. 
and um, uh, it's um, a book where he um, described the principles by which he um, built his company, which is um, a um, extremely successful company, and how the same principles apply to his life. And it's a little bit um, a nice uh, uh, journey that we talk about it after the Big Five for Life, you know, because um, obviously I'm, I was always driven by what do we as individuals need in order to succeed, to have a meaningful life, to have the skills that help us thrive and, uh, um, and be, be useful and uh, enjoy ourselves. Mm, but more and more, I obviously also got interested in um, what does it mean to be a good leader? What does it mean to build an interesting organization? What does it mean to lead a, an organization? And there is, you know, as you know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands up on uh, leadership books out there. And uh, a lot of it, I feel, is really not interesting to me. Um, but uh, why I like principles so much is because Ray Dalio is such an extreme person. So he has quite um, uh, extreme points of view. So, for example, he's obsessed with transparency. So they have a system in which they um, have to um, basically on investment decisions um, uh, always um, a sort of the decision making is always uh, um, uh, observed and uh, uh, recorded and then um, shared with everybody. So I know how you um, decided on each investment and whether there was a good decision or a bad decision. Right? And so everybody knows about everybody's performance all the time. Um, and which for him was one of the drivers of how he built an organization that was learning very quickly right, from the mistakes that, we were, that they were making. And so I think it's not about do you always agree with him or do you always agree with principles, but it's a very specific point of view of how to build an organization. And I found, uh, I found it really uh, super interesting, especially taking into account that he was so obsessed with how do we build something that is kind to people, that allows people to be their best version of themselves to, you know, as you said, everybody, what, what, what I really think is a good sign of an organization is if you come in somewhere and you have lots of different people that all seem to be comfortable with who they are and how they are. And if they want to wear a suit, that's cool. And if they want to wear a hoodie, that's cool. And if they uh, sort of eat with their fingers over lunch or with chopsticks or with fork and knife, that's all great but they're united by a joint idea of what they want to achieve together. And you feel that energy of we're getting stuff done and we're really making something amazing happen together. Um, and uh, he obviously really achieved to build that energy. And I'm always curious about how um, leaders in big organizations are able to build that energy. Because I think this is what then ultimately drives culture and which is what drives success in larger organizations. So that's why I think Principles is a fascinating book. Mm -hmm. But what are your general thoughts on investment? Because everybody talks about securing a future. And as a leader of an organization, sometimes you don't know if you want to invest in the organization that you're working in, you throw in your resources to mm -hmm. push it to profitability, or do you take away something that you've made from it to say, let me invest in other things mm. to raise revenue from other alternative sources. Yeah. So I think there's two different um, aspects that I, that I hear when I listen to you. The first one is, how do I go about my personal resources as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. if I'm building an organ a company, right? And there, I think, you know, if you're putting in your life energy, and you're in there every day, then to me, this always is also the place where I put my resources, right? Because I think, you know, um, if you're throwing yourself fully into something, but you're not putting in your financial resources, then what's the point of it, right? So then it's very, it's gonna, you make it even harder on yourself to succeed, right? But obviously, I think the goal should be um, to me, and that's a very personal op opinion, to get 
profitable as quickly as possible. Right? So I, I was never so excited about these business models or these companies that needed lots and lots and lots of rounds of investment. And they were always loss making and kept being loss making, kept being loss making, kept being loss making. Right? Obviously, some of the biggest companies in the world today were built like that. But to me, I'm more interested in building organizations that can live on, on, on their own. And for that, it means to be to make a profit, right? Mm -hmm. So that means until you make a profit and you need a very clear plan of how you make the organization succeed and survive, right? I think it's fine to put your resources there. I think thinking about investment for of your own money, to me, gets relevant once your organization succeeds and you get money out, right? And then the question is, when, how long do you leave money in and keep reinvesting to keep growing? And when is it legitimate to, um, uh, to actually get some money out and use it for something else? Mm -hmm. And there, I think every case is different. But I would say is that um, entrepreneurs and founders and especially social entrepreneurs or people who are uh, driven by trying to solve a problem mm -hmm. um, are usually too hard on themselves. So I think it's really important that you pay yourself. I think it's really important that you pay yourself well. I think it's really important that you don't uh, sort of say, well, financially it's not really going so well, but I'm doing something that's good for the world, mm -hmm. right? Because the one can't make up for the other. You need to find a way where you and your family can live a good life and you can make a difference, right? Yeah. Um, whether that's in a non, not for profit or for profit doesn't really matter so much. But um, I think the investment piece is, I think if you're putting your time, time is more precious than money, then you might as well put your money in, get profitable as quickly as possible. And once you have money coming out of the business, I think um, I'm always, you know, I'm more excited in investing in the company again, um, uh, instead of now taking money on the bank account and investing it in stock options or something like that, right? Mm. Um, but that's everybody's personal choice. Okay. So when I sat here, the first book that struck me on your bookshelf was this one, Reason for Hope by Jen Kodo. Tell us about this book. Yes, so um, there's a couple of books on the list that are written by, by friends or people uh, I know and, and love um, dearly. So Jane is one of them. We've been working with her for quite a number of years. And what I um, um, admire about her is um, that she is extremely resolved and adamant about what problem she wants to solve, right? What drives her? And she's tough about it, and she's very uh, um, vocal about it, and she can be quite um, harsh about it when she feels that somebody is doing something wrong, or is you know she's very concerned about the environment. She's very concerned about animal welfare. She's concerned about um, you know how hard it was for her as a young woman to actually make a career as a scientist, even though she had amazing insights, right, of uh, being the first one to prove that um, animals can build tools, can be tool makers as well, and not just humans. Um, so she's very, this is my life, this is where I dedicated my life to, this is the problem I want to solve, and I put all my life's energy into that. But at the same time, um, there's no despair, there's no bitterness, there's no um, anger really, right? Um, even though she's seen lots and lots of stuff going wrong. What, what, what was your takeout from this book? The takeout from Jane's uh, book? So as I said, for me, the, the, um, the, having the privilege of knowing her personally, um, the, the takeout of meeting her is quite similar from what I get from the books. Mm -hmm. She's written a couple. Um, and it is really about how do you not lose yourself in the audacity of the task that you're trying to under undertake, right? Mm. This, I'm trying to do something big. It is very daunting. It is also very concerning. And um, I'm staying humble. I'm staying true to my task, but I don't get overwhelmed by it. I don't get angry. I don't get bitter. I don't get frustrated. I don't get sad. I'm doing what I can 
and I'm enjoying myself in the process. Mm -hmm. And you know, somebody once said that um, uh, 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 sort of creating lightness is a heavy piece of work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. And Jane is one of the masters of being able to see the hope and not the despair. And that I think I take from her in the books. Yeah. You mentioned that she is a scientist. Mm -hmm. And uh, more often than not, they always seem to be science and spirituality are always in two separate uh, corners of the room. Mm -hmm. how, how do you fuse them looking at her perspective and how? So I, I think that um, there's a growing understanding that um, reason and rationality alone is not what creates um, wisdom or um, maybe even uh, just a full life. And so what I see is no, I, I'm, you know, no matter whether I talk to people that have a certain religious belief or not, I do feel that <clears throat> people are actually interest, getting more curious and more interested, certainly also those leaders that are a bit older in trying to really work on themselves, right? The inner work. And I think the inner work is where um, also spirit, uh, spirituality sits as a topic, right? Um, and for me, therefore, I deal with a lot of people who are very, who have very high powered jobs, who have uh, very big responsibilities, who are scientists or government leaders or mathematicians or whatnot and who are deeply involved in the question of who are they, how can they better themselves, how can they understand their own needs better, what's happening with them when they're not here anymore. And uh, so I think this idea of having to nurture yourself, especially again in a time in which many of the challenges we're dealing with seem, seem quite overwhelming, mm -hmm. is something that is, uh, I th is, I think, becoming more important and more people are open to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that the separation is not so strict anymore. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Florian, one of the books you've spoken about is The Goddess of Small Victories. Mm -hmm. right? Tell us about The Goddess of Small Victories. So the, the, um, the Goddess of Small Victories, it's, um, it's a book that I also have a special relationship to because I know the author. And I really like the book because it's one of those books, there's a whole genre which takes a a factual history or biography and turns it into a fictitious, uh, fictitious uh, story, right? So in that case, it's a book about the wife of Gödel. Gödel is one of the most famous mathematicians, uh, a difficult man, Jew, um, emigrated from uh, um, uh, Germany during the Hitler um, uh, horrible years to the US went to the university there and she had as his wife being sort of you know in this traditional gender relationship quite a difficult life trying to support him and um, it tells her story and uh, first of all i really like the book because it brings to life a a character which might have lived like that or not i don't know right but it's this play between what is real and what is the story so that's the one thing why I like the book a lot. The second thing is that I, uh, I know the author and um, <clears throat> while she was um, ri uh, uh, writing it, I uh, met her together with my wife in the Philippines uh, traveling. And um, she was talking about the process of um, uh, writing the book. And to me that for the first time again got me really excited again about the idea of writing myself. Um, and the third bit why I really like the book and I have a personal relationship with it is because my wife and I always had a competition of who writes uh, the, uh, the, uh, his or her book first. Um, and whereas I ended up writing the, our, our New World as the first one, she got mentioned in this book earlier because she helped out on some of the ideas and so, and so she's in the dedication. Um, uh, and we were always talking about that, um, uh, especially since then some of the stuff that she supported on, which was sort of, you know, Austrian turn of the century, how do you deal with uh, some of the language uh, was quite a, quite a highlight. Mm -hmm. So again, a book about 
um, uh, Strong Women, a book about um, what's real and what's story, and just about making me uh, remind myself of how much fun it is to to contribute and to create creative works. Right, you're a, you're a storyteller, you're a um, a journalist and a, a filmmaker, yeah. and this idea that you can actually take a project and you can think of it, dream of it, and make it happen. Yeah. And how much what a powerful, wonderful feeling that is. So that is what that book reminds me of. Yeah. But talking about ability, uh, Florian, most of the time you've met people who um, are dreamers and they're chasers. But as well, you've met people who are dreamers but aren't here chasing. What, what has been that one thing that you tell them, this person who is a dreamer but is yet to chase? Hasn't, isn't a doer, let me mm -hmm. use that word. Yeah. What 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 do you input in them to kick them, to kickstart them? So um, it's a great question. I think a really difficult question. So I think um, I think it's very hard to convince somebody to get going. I think that conviction and that urge has to come from within. Mm -hmm. But I do think that you can create a supporting environment where you take a little bit maybe away some of the fear of what it would take to get going. And um, you know where, where, um, where what I always say is if, if you have a if you have a dream or you are a dreamer but you're not moving on the dream then <clears throat> obviously you make a very rational argument of why it might not be the time or it might not be the place or it might be too risky, or it might be weirdly perceived by your loved ones or whatnot. Mm. Um, and I'm just trying to help that, that person to think through what the risk is of not doing it. Right? If you have that dream and you're not following through on it, um, uh, and, uh, um, then that's, that's a real risk. And thinking through that perspective, and often, you know, what the examples that I bring is something that we call a, a, a journey uh, from the future, right? Where you're, where you're say, hey, just think of yourself, Mike, and you're sitting here, it's 2030. Uh, your youngest kid will be, what is it, like uh, seven years old seven or eight years, years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're sitting there and <laughs> how does your life look like? Right? What do you do? How do you, what do you eat? How, uh, what do you wear? Sort of where do you live? Um, and now think about that in a way where you've gone for that dream and it's worked out. Um, and think about if and you've gone for that dream, it hasn't worked out, and you've never gone for that dream. And how does your life actually look like, right? And, um, and I think putting people a little bit into this, the perspective of understanding also the risk of not going for something and feeling that mm -hmm. um, is what often helps, in my experience, people to get a bit more courage, right? Because it's not su a surprise that often people get sad about their choices when they have a very uh, um, sort of tragic situation, you know, when their parents die or their spouse passes or whatnot. That's when sort of regret comes up. Mm -hmm. And it's this old story when my mom passed or when, you know, I have, I have friends and they have people passing or their partners or whatnot. And towards the end, sort of what are the regrets that you're really sort of that you say, oh, shit, this I really should have done differently. Yeah. And so if you do have a dream, then <clears throat> I always think you should go for it in some shape or other. I also have to say last sentence that not everybody has a dream all the time and not everybody needs to have a dream all the time. That's totally fine. I think it's also totally cool if you make your way through your life going from one opportunity to the other. And, you know, my personal life has been an endless, I have the feeling, um, uh, sort of uh, succession of accidents. <laughs> I was always curious and I was looking, but sort of the stuff that happened was never what I had planned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's always something else. So I, I do think that there's different ways of, you don't need the grand plan, you don't need the one dream. Um, but I think it's about being open to opportunity and keeping asking yourself what it is that you really burn for, what it is that uh, gives, you, gives you passion and joy. Yeah. But I want to ask you, Florian, you're running an, uh, an organization is in, that is in multiple countries. You have 
challenges you're trying to solve each and every time. You have a family, you have people who depend on you. How do you take care of yourself? So, so I definitely think that that's a challenge. Uh, if you're, so in general, it's a challenge if you're very driven by a problem. And especially, I think, if you're an entrepreneur and a founder, because being a founder tends to be quite lonely. Yeah. It's very hard to, to talk to other people about your experience. Um, and so I definitely had a couple of years in sort of the uh, very hefty build up years where I didn't take very good care of myself. So if I look back at my 30s, um, then I would say that's probably the one regret that I have is that I just, I stopped doing sports. I stopped taking care of giving myself time to just be and, and relax. And because I was so in the grind and so driven and every day and hardcore and if, as much as I could. And that obviously also led to the organization probably growing so quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think it's really important not to forget yourself in the process um, because being one year faster with the organization if your health is gone is really not a great trade-off. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I think for me the challenge and that, that depends a little bit on your personality but for me what I'm really interested in is because I'm quite an extreme guy, I have lots of ideas and I go for them and they give me energy. Mm. And so for me, the question is, how do I create balance in my life? How do I create a state where I have the feeling that I'm, um, I have fire, but I don't have fireworks, mm. right? It's not about the singular bang, 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 <laughs> but it's a constant flame. Yeah. And for that, it's about regularly taking care of myself and that means having a rhythm right where I have my sport a certain times a week where I have uh, whatever it is if I have to go to the doctor or physio or whatnot I have that I make time for it um, where I have time for my family mm -hmm. for my partner for my friends uh, and I also live in the now not only in the future right often as entrepreneurs you're like oh if I've achieved this right but as we all know, life is happening right now. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. Yeah. Go to that concert. You know, you can work hard, but then you can go to that concert or you can go for dinner or you can go take care of your mom or dad or whatever it is, right? So I think with me, balance comes through discipline. Um, and part of the discipline is a discipline of taking care of yourself. Let's talk about the Book of Joy. But this one, Tutu and Dalai Lama. Yes, so it goes into a similar direction as Jane's book. Um, I, I had the pleasure of, um, or I know both of, uh, of, the, of the gentlemen, obviously um, Desmond Tutu no longer with us, but um, um, met him a couple of times. And even though they're obviously different, they're united by sort of uh, having a strong faith. But what I found um, really fascinating about both of them and what the book is describes in a very nice manner mm -hmm is sort of this idea that these are people who deal with very serious tasks, right? Say so they have um, very um, uh, high reputation roles, they have enemies, they have supporters, they're considered, well, were considered wise men, they um, experience a lot of hardship in their life, um, they um, uh, took unpopular decisions, they were in roles where they were often quite lonely, and nevertheless, when you sort of listen to Desmond Tutu, um, I don't think I've met anybody else who in giving half an hour speech was giggling more than this guy, right? So there was so much fun and childlike enjoyment every time I met him. And um, <clears throat> the same a little bit with the Dalai Lama. So I once had a dinner in the UK with the Dalai Lama and somebody over dinner asked him, how he knows that um, this was a particularly good day for him. And you know, he's a, obviously um, a Buddhist, so harming no, um, no creature is one of the credos of the faith. But what he answered was, you know, I know that it was a really good day, that I was in a really good mood. If when at some point in the evening a, mos a mosquito was trying to bite me, I let it happen. I realized a mosquito got to have his or her dinner too. <laughs> and to me, that was, you know, it's such a nice description of um, uh, how much, how generous you can be, but also how much fun yeah. you can have with uh, topics that are actually quite serious. 
And whereas I think Jane is sort of the, the driven activist that has sort of this one topic, but she's able to rope people in in a hopeful manner. Mm -hmm. I think what the two gentlemen to me always personified was that um, there's, there's, it's your duty or your ability to enjoy and bring joy to others in every moment of your life, no matter how hard it might be. Yeah, and, um, and I think their lives and their characters is a celebration. I've seen them standing next to head of states and, you know, everybody was looking very serious and very grumpy. And those two were giggling. And um, I find that uh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So how, how would you describe your reading habits? So I'm, um, I, I've always been, actually as a kid I hated reading uh, and then at some point it clicked and from then on I've been reading like crazy. I read extremely fast so, um, uh, and that sometimes means I don't read very thoroughly. Uh, um, which also means that sometimes books that I really love I read them a couple of times. Um, I usually read between one or two books a week. Um, but I have to say, in the past, um, I read very serious books like philosophy and politics and all that, business leadership books and whatnot. And now, <clears throat> more and more, I also read fun books. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, uh, there's one uh, even series on the list uh, that, that's uh, I don't even know whether it came out in oops, it came out in English, but in in French and German, it's called. Uh, 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 the, terrible the, the Terrible Adele, and it's basically a, a series of kids' comics about a girl who's um, uh, in a sort of who's a horrible child, and the whole, you know she has a cat. She's uh, the whole one book is just about fifty different ways in which she's trying to kill the cat, or <laughs> sort of drive the, her parents to uh, exasperation, and um, this is stuff that not uh, I I love for two reasons nowadays. One is because. I have a, an incredible daughter and I read now a lot of stuff with her. So I have to read all the Harry Potter books up and down. And so we read to each other a lot. And now she's starting to read to me, but I read to her a lot. And, um, and it's amazing then to see how your children are developed their own preferences around humor, around, you know, irony or cynicism, or can I actually laugh about that kid trying to kill her cat? Is that cool or is that actually wrong? And, yeah. um, so by now, long story short, I read a lot of lighthearted things as well and especially enjoy reading aloud with my daughter. Mm -hmm. So how do you determine what do you want to read next? So um, either um, friends um, that also read a lot put me um, onto a new good book. Mm. Or I do go through the lists, right, sort of the big New York Times lists, Economist lists or so, um, what's currently out there, especially in our field. Is there around <clears throat> organizational transformation, leadership change? Is there around supporting entrepreneurs? Is there amazing new books that help you think through new ways to innovate around sustainability, the climate crisis? Um, but also I'm, I'm always reading very widely, so I'm not a person would read 20, book, uh, 20 books on the same topic, but then I read one around AI in China and at the same time I read one on sustainability and then <clears throat> I might read a uh, sort of a, a book, the book of poems of, uh, um, of Cohen, sort of one of the, um, the great musicians uh, of our time who passed away and I'm reading them in between each other and at the same time and uh, it's and yeah and by now I also because I travel so much I read a lot on my phone mm. and then also just sometimes just fun books. Which was gonna be my next question do you prefer physical book or you the digital stuff audiobooks what's your so preference? I definitely prefer physical books because I love so at home I actually have massive bookshelves and I've ordered them by color and um, I love having books and beautiful books are something, you know, if I think about my possessions and what I would really need and want to take along, it's probably stuff in my kitchen and my bookshelf, right? The rest, I don't really, I mean, maybe a couple of paint art pieces yeah. that I have. But other than that, I don't really care about a certain sofa or a certain tech device or so. But yeah. if I would move somewhere, I would need to take the books that I love with me. Do you have like a favorite genre of books? 
Um, no, I said so. I do read, tend to read more uh, non-fiction books than fiction books. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> But um, I also, for example, have a terrible habit of liking to read certain um, fantasy novels and stuff. So just, you know, light reading, yeah. um, something fun in between. So I read really all sorts of different things. Most of the books we've spoken about, uh, you've met either the, the authors or you know the authors in, in, in person. But do you have a, a favorite author? Do you have people who you like? Um, I have a couple of favorite authors, but it's I don't have the one. So the one book that was on the on the list that we haven't spoken about is a book called Discovery of Heavens, mm -hmm. which is by um, an author that um, I admired very much when I was a teenager. So the author is called Harry Mulisch. He was a Dutch gentleman, and he wrote this incredible book that is part. Uh, a book about two friends that grew up after the Second World War in Europe and um, about being left or right wing and being an, uh, an, a sort of an artist versus a, um, a scientist about uh, falling in love with the same woman and going to Cuba and meeting Fidel Castro and all these amazing things. And at the same time, it's a, uh, it's a fantasy novel around um, uh, the idea of God and how God influences the real world or not. And so I loved that uh, book as a, as a teenager and I loved it so much that I wanted to meet uh, that author. And so um, I, I, I um, devised a plan um, and actually uh, worked as a, uh, in, a, in a production company um, when I was sort of 18 or so. And um, uh, I, um, I just called up the, the agent of that author and I said well I'm calling from a television production company and can I make uh, do an interview with uh, Harry Mulisch and the agent was like well you know of course that Mr. Mulisch doesn't give interviews anymore for the last five years but actually because he's turning uh, 75 he would make an exception and do a birthday interview uh, but uh, am I right that you're calling from the um, German public television station and I'm like uh, oh yes, oh yes, no problem. And then I um, finished the call and panically asked uh, the, the guy who was running the production company <laughs> to call the German public television station, which obviously once they knew that this author would give them an interview, they would. bought that interview from us. Mm -hmm. And so I traveled uh, to Venice to a very famous hotel in uh, which Thomas Mann, another famous author, had stayed and he stays stayed every year. And so we did this... Um, interview in a beautiful ballroom um, and <clears throat> to be honest I didn't care at all about the interview I just wanted to be done with the interview so that I could ask him about what it means to be an author and what I can learn from him and so it was a very long interview and then at one point it was done and I said ah, Mr. Mulish could I ask you just a couple of questions and he's like well you know my wife is waiting and my kid is waiting I really got to go what do you want to know and I said well um, how does one become an author I, I think I want to become a writer, you know, I was 18, how do I become an author? And he looked at me and said, Florian, you either are an author or you're not. If you are an author, you know it. If you don't know it, you're not an author. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> And so I was obviously devastated <laughs> and uh, forgot about being an author for a very long time. <laughs> but that was one of my crushes of uh, authors that I liked very much. So yeah. sometimes not meeting your heroes might be the better option. Might be the better option. <laughs> right. And, but now when, when, you, when you look at um, that whole world and the culture, I think you mentioned that you've inculcated in your kids. Um, people who want to build that practice of reading. You said you were never reading. In fact, you said you, you didn't like reading. Did you say you hated or you didn't like? My mom really wanted me to read because she was an academic. And um, <clears throat> so she kept giving me books when I was a kid and I never wanted to have anything to do with them. And then when I was like nine, 10, I started reading comics, mm -hmm. all sorts of comics. And then suddenly from the age of 12, 13 onwards, uh, after she had given up, I just, it clicked and I started reading and I read everything that I could get my hands on. What, what worked for you that could work for somebody who is struggling to start? Um, oh, I mean, I think it's just about um, finding, 
finding a world that you are curious about, right? Because the beauty of books is that you learn about the world in a personal manner without being there, right? You, you can, in one life, you can live a million lives if you read a million books and that no other medium, I think, can give you because the fantasy in your head is so much richer than what you watch on the screen. Yeah. Um, and so I think the, que <clears throat> the question is not, does somebody want to read or not? The question is, what world are you curious about that you want to learn about? Right? Yeah. And obviously if some, some kids or adults or whatnot never had the opportunity to get exposure to uh, these other worlds. I think so, as always, try to be a bit curious and look into stuff that you might like. Yeah. And, and you also as an author, does it worry you sometimes that there will be maybe other pirated copies of your own book or something? No. No, I am. Um, so A, I have the privilege that I don't need to live from my income as an author, which obviously makes me more relaxed. But and, and to me, sort of, you know, the reason why I wrote the book is because I wanted to reach as many people as possible. And also ideally people who are not already thinking like that, right? People who might not be the ones anyway, so already like you out and about changing the world, but people who reading the book might get courage to start uh, start and do something different and so the more people see it, the better but I also again I think that the interesting bit is what is an a, a series of storytelling activities that you can create so we're thinking now about doing a tv show or you know telling it in different formats and so the book for me is still a beautiful anchor because it's such an important way of telling a story but you have so many more means at your, at, at your availability, right? Um, and you can tell it in social media, you can tell it through a podcast, you can tell it and the world can see it immediately. How amazing is that? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Florian. Thank you for your time. And thank you for allowing us to stand next to your office shelf. We hope one day we'll get to interact with that precious shelf of yours at home. But also just um, thank you for allowing us to uh, travel with you the world and just capture part of the wisdom you've gathered uh, from many books. I'm sure we would have wanted to talk about more. There is still a book that I can, I'm seeing here, I feel like I would have wanted to hear your feedback on it, the, the, the discovery of heavens. I don't know if you can quickly talk about that as we close. Yeah, I'll, I'll briefly talk about it, but I would close, if it's okay, with another book. And that uh, book is one that is also very dear to me by um, uh, an author from the Netherlands, also called Rutger Bregman, and it's called Humankind. And it summarizes a little bit some of the themes that we discussed today, namely it starts with a very, it's, it starts with a very simple um, sort of fact, namely that a lot of the philosophies and histories of the world have been written in the understanding that uh, humans are actually tend to be evil or bad, right? So it's sort of the Thomas Hobbes, homo homini lupus, the uh, humans are wolves to each other. Um, and he shows research that shows that actually, if in doubt, humans are actually quite good. And the way they behave to, towards each other is also quite good, right? I think you, you, may, you may know sort of the famous Stanford prisoners experiment, you know, where you give some people, make them prisoners and some people make them sort of the guards and how they start acting very horribly towards each other. Yeah. <clears throat> and he proves, for example, that, that the entire experiment was tweaked. So it was not entirely uh, true, but it was actually pushed to the extent so that the outcome was the way it was. And so the entire book, if you get a handle on it, you have to read it, is showcasing that when in doubt, people are good towards each other. I think um, uh, what books give me often as pleasure is the ability to get new hope and new ideas of what I can do, what we can all do to drive a future that's better for all of us. That's why um, I love reading books and it's been a privilege to talk uh, to you about, uh, about them. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, Florian. That's Florian Hoffman, founder of The Do. Check it out, thedo.world, and see what they do. My name is Mulure Mike, and this is What's on Your Shelf. See you again on the next one.